All right, thank everyone for coming today. If I could ask you to all please rise for the singing of our national anthem. Today our national anthem will be performed by Miss Ashley Sundstrom, who is the intern at the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you very much. You go ahead and have a seat. And before we get started today, we are very honored to have the Director of Communications and Programs here at the Ronald Reagan Foundation, Ms. Melissa Giller, here to give some opening remarks. So please welcome Ms. Giller. Good morning. That was a tough act to follow. That was really good. <laughs> Two days ago, Newt Gingrich announced that he was running for president, not through a press conference, but by issuing statements on Facebook and Twitter. Is this really becoming the predominant way we're sharing news? Okay, so true story. Two years ago, while lying on a beach in Hawaii with my family, my then seventh grade niece gets a text from her friend, and it said, OMG, Michael Jackson is dead. Now, I didn't believe it, I thought it was a hoax at the time, but when we got in the car, I turned on the news, and sure enough, it, the text was correct. And just a week and a half ago, I was in my house playing with my kids, and my husband was on Facebook. We didn't have a TV on in the house, and he said that all of his friends were posting on Facebook that Osama bin Laden was dead. We quickly turned on CNN, and sure enough, and had, we, had my husband not been on Facebook, who knows how many more hours would have gone by before we heard this important story. In both instances, I learned about the news not from the traditional news, but from social media. Yes, I confirmed what was going on by turning the television news on, but that wasn't my first point of contact. What does this really mean for the way in which we engage with one another and share information? When I was asked to give today's introduction, I have to admit, I immediately got nervous. Not because speaking in public makes me uncomfortable, but because the topic, mixed with the audience, made me a little intimidated. Why? Because I'd be remiss to think that I know more about social media than you. <laughs> but through my job here as the Director of Communications for the Reagan Foundation, I have definitely learned the importance and the reach of social media, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, in getting out our message and the message of Ronald Reagan, and in pulling people together through the power of his words. By using current issues of the day, we can instantly send out some piece of communication which not only keeps Ronald Reagan relevant in today's news cycle, but reaches constituents from all over the world at every age level, potentially introducing President Reagan's beliefs and policies to people who may just now be learning about him. For example, following the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound, we immediately added a quote on our Facebook and Twitter pages from Ronald Reagan's remarks in 1986 one day after the United States airstrike against Libya. We posted, terrorism is the preferred weapon of weak and evil men. And as Edmund Burke reminded us, in order for evil to succeed, it's only necessary that good men do nothing. Yesterday we demonstrated once again that doing nothing is not America's policy. 
it's not America's way. That quote was read, retweeted, reposted, and commented on by thousands of people who, without the advent of social media, we would not have been able to reach, at least not as quickly or as widespread. Social media thus becomes the opportunity to speak with people from all over the world that you might not have had the opportunity to speak with otherwise in an instantaneous approach, to spread your message, to share your cause, to rally the troops. During President Reagan's farewell address to the nation, he reflected back on the things he had done and the things he had said, and he remarked, and in all the time I won a nickname, the great communicator, but I never thought it was my style or the words I used that made a difference. It was the content. I wasn't a great communicator, but I communicated great things. Obviously, social media, as it is understood today, didn't exist when President Reagan was president. His ideas, or his content, were communicated through television, radio, newspaper, public speeches. We can only guess now how his messages and causes would have been spread differently if Facebook and Twitter were around. That's why it's our job at the Reagan Foundation to communicate his ideals through social media to help continue his legacy and share his principles today and far into the future. As Ronald Reagan once said, let us be sure that those who come after us will say of us in our time that in our time we did everything that could be done. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Melissa. Before we get started today, I wanted to acknowledge a few of our guests and thank them for coming. Uh, Mr. Stanley Mantooth, who is the Ventura County Superintendent of Schools. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> uh, we also have with us today Marty Tippins Murphy, who is a member of our National Advisory Council uh, and does some amazing work with the organization Facing History and Ourselves. So Marty Tippins Murphy. Uh, and also her colleague, also from Facing History and Ourselves, Ms. Mary Hendra. Thank you for coming. And we are also delighted to have Christian Linke, who is the program director at the Arcelin program, whose work focuses on youth civic engagement. And he's also responsible for sponsoring the attendance of uh, Mr. Kenny and his students, who are uh, tweeting and Facebooking and uh, giving commentary as we go through the program today. So thank you very much. And also a hello to our live audience of students and to people who are watching uh, on the internet. Thank you for spending about 90 minutes of your time today listening in on this very important conversation. At the end of the last millennium, Time Life magazine selected Johann Gutenberg's printing press as the single most important invention of the previous thousand years. It beat out inventions such as the automobile, vaccines, telephones, airplanes, refrigerators, and even the personal computer. Why? Why is it that something that helps mass produce books is considered more important than cars, which change the way that industry and transportation work? Why is it that the printing press is more important than vaccines, which have saved countless lives across the globe? Or why is it more important than the computer, which has changed the way we learn, the way we work, and the way we communicate with one another? Why? Because as Sir Francis Bacon once said, knowledge is power. Books were the first item in the history of mankind to be mass produced. What would once take a scribe countless hours to copy could now be printed hundreds and even thousands of times at a fairly rapid rate. The wide availability of printed matter led to a tremendous rise in literacy rates. No longer did you have to be from a, a wealthy family or the son of a nobleman or a member of the clergy to attain a manuscript and to read. Reading in books, and even more important than the books, the ideas within the books were suddenly available to large segments of the population. And what did this mean? Well, it meant some pretty drastic changes in the way the world worked. In religion, the church clergy were no longer the only ones able to read and interpret the Bible. This led to the reformation of the Catholic Church and drastic changes in the way Christianity and religion worked. In the United States, Printing enabled men like Benjamin Franklin to rise to fame and influence. And in fact, even later in his life, Ben Franklin always referred to himself as a printer. And the ideas that led to the American Revolution, the ideas of Rousseau, Locke, Paine, Jefferson, these too were spread through the use of the printing press. It was the original form of mass communication. 
And as history moved forward, mass communication evolved, became even quicker, became more efficient, and reached a larger audience. In the 30s and 40s, President Roosevelt used a radio to effectively communicate with an entire country during his fireside chats during the Depression and World War II. In the 1960s, John F. Kennedy used his good looks, his charisma, and the power of television to help ride a wave to the presidency. And Ronald Reagan, the namesake of this library and museum, used mass communication, first to rise to prominence as a radio announcer and movie star, and then as president, he utilized mass communication to console the nation after the explosion of the Challenger space shuttle, to denounce the evils of oppressive communist regimes, to help bring down the Berlin Wall, and to restore America's confidence in itself. And now we have the next iteration of mass communication in the form of social media. It's the quickest, cheapest, most efficient way to share information with a large audience. In a sense, sites like Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, they've taken the power of Gutenberg's printing press and placed it in the hands of anyone who has access to a computer or a smartphone. As recently as a decade ago, if I told you that you could have a piece of equipment the size of a candy bar, put it in your pocket and be able to communicate with anyone anywhere in the world <laughs> in a second, you would have looked at me like I was crazy. This was the things of science fiction. Now, it's an everyday reality. As social media evolves, we see the further democratization of mass communication. You don't have to go through a publisher to share your thoughts, ideas, writings, pictures, videos with the world. You can blog, tweet, upload to YouTube, and it'll be there in seconds. It's faster and more efficient than ever before to share news and information. It's easier than ever before for companies, organizations, celebrities, and politicians to communicate with and inspire their followers, encouraging them to buy goods, volunteer their services, and organize in an effort to bring about powerful change in their communities and the world. And what does that mean for you, the students and educators in our audience today? What does the ease and scale of social media mean? Well, it means that you have a tremendous amount of power. It means that you have the power to share your ideas, to influence others, to connect with those who share your passions, to engage with those who think differently than you do, and to affect positive change. President Eisenhower, one of President Reagan's great friends and mentors, once said that there is nothing wrong with America that the faith, love of freedom, intelligence, and energy of her citizens cannot cure. And social media offers an opportunity for citizens both in America and abroad to join together in pursuit of making their communities better. Today's panel will examine the connections between being civically engaged and the use of social and digital media, with a specific focus on the ways in which young people, like the students we have in the audience today, are able to leverage their use of social media as tools to promote civic engagement. Our panelists today come to us from a diverse group of organizations. Uh, at the far end of the table from the Harry Potter Alliance, a group that uses the mythology of the Harry Potter stories to inspire good deeds across the country, we have founder and executive director, Mr. Andrew Slack. Uh, from the National Conference on Citizenship, which is a congressionally chartered organization that among many other things, <coughs> excuse me, measures the civic health of the country, we have Kristen Campbell, who is the director of New Media and Programs. Uh, from Splash Life, a movement that works with members to volunteer, donate, exert their citizenship, produce, share content, all in exchange for points that can unlock deals on anything from textbooks to jeans to laptops and healthcare, we have founder and CEO, Melissa Helmbrecht. <laughs> and from the Digital Youth Network, a group that gives students digital tools to foster engaged, informed, and collaborative citizens, we have the Director of Digital Strategy and Development, Mr. Akili Lee. And I'm really excited because a couple of our panelists will be tweeting live from up here on stage. So if you see them picking up their phones, it's not that they're distracted. They're actually going to be tweeting their own reactions and things like that as the panel is going on. So though the work they do is, is quite different, they all seek to promote civic engagement. I'm really looking forward to the conversation we're going to have. And you're probably tired of listening to me speak. So I'm going to begin with our panelists and open up with a question that uh, some of you, when we went out to classrooms in the last week or so, we asked you the same question. And it's not one I think that's necessarily easy to answer, uh, which is why I thought I'd put it to them, because they're very smart people and probably have some good ideas. 
But so my first question is, let's give a little context. What does it mean to be civically engaged? And if you could also share a bit and talk about how your organization works to promote civic engagement. So maybe I'll start, I'll just start closest to me and we can move our way down uh, for this one and then we'll open it up and feel free to you know, jump in and respond. Uh, so, Akira, okay. go ahead. Um, so again, I think this is a, a term that definitely probably has a different meaning to different people, and I think that's okay, and I think we should embrace that to some extent. Um, so for me, I would define you know, being civically engaged as being an active member of, of your community, however you want to define community. That can be anywhere from your school, your block, um, your city, your country, um, looking at yourself as a global citizen, but how are you, one, staying aware of what's going on around you, and how are you taking an active part in determining what goes on around you? So recognizing that everything around you is essentially malleable, right? It can be all be changed. And how can you leverage whatever skills you have, be it traditional media, leveraging social media, um, you know, traditional kind of activism work, et cetera, how can you leverage those skills that you guys have, whatever's unique to you, to make sure that you're actually contributing to that reality that's around you. So not being kind of a static part of some larger group and not necessarily seeing yourself as being one who can really be a catalyst for change. I think if you are civically engaged, it's you are remaining and making sure you're informed around what's going on around you. And you're also taking an active part in trying to impact uh, um, some things for the better in terms of what's going on around you. Um, the way we try to approach that with DYN um, really kind of echoes a lot of the points that Tony made in his intro uh, comments really around, I think we start with kind of the literacy component. So literacy doesn't necessarily sound like a great fun thing. It doesn't necessarily sound like it's something that relates to technology, even in social media. But you know, I think being informed is really the first part about being an active citizen and being also being connected to this larger community, whatever, however you actually decide, decide to define community. And that transition that we've kind of seen over the, you know, the decades from printing press to radio to television and now to the internet, um, it really kind of redefines how we need to necessarily approach literacy, right? So how do you communicate? How do you get information? Um, and you know, the same comments we heard that we're finding out about Bin Laden, Michael Jackson, et cetera, through Twitter, Facebook, or maybe text messaging, et cetera, you know, people are interacting in very different ways. You know, the sources of information right now are not as kind of centralized as they had been when you had to rely on the printing press, right? If it was the printing press, only a certain number of folk had resources to actually publish books, publish newspapers, et cetera. Right now, anybody in here can create, you know, you can do anything from a tweet to a blog, your own website, your own web magazine, um, and you can do all that with just having access to a smartphone or a computer. So from our perspective, Perspective with DYN is really saying how can we work with young people to make sure that you guys have those skills to leverage technology, um, understanding that it is a different landscape right now. So if you, whether it's you know anything that dealing with technology and digital media, how can you be a better informed kind of citizen and member of your community, and then how can you also leverage those skills to kind of be a little bit more active person to kind of uh, impact what's going on around you as well. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Same question. Sure. I think um, that in terms of uh, all of you are high school students, and I remember when I was in high school that what I thought it meant to be civically engaged was to believe politically whatever my parents believed. So when I was in ninth grade, um, everybody that my parents wanted to vote for and what they cared about is what I cared about. I think that part of becoming civically engaged really means making up your own mind and coming up with your own ideas for what you stand for and what you believe in. Um, high school is really the time when you start to explore all kinds of political issues and social causes. and begin to decide what it is that you believe and what you want to stand for. So I think um, civic engagement is different at different phases of your life. I think that as high school students, um, the most important thing is to figure out you know, what you're going to stand for and, and what you're going to believe you know, by participating in a school debate program, by following uh, current events, you know, it's like Wyclef wanted to run for president of Haiti. What was that about? I mean, there's all these issues and things. And to just not be a spectator, but to really, like, research and, 
use the internet to search, if you hear something like Wyclef wants to run for president of Haiti, to get on Google and to search it out and to figure out why he wants to do that and what it means um, and, and to develop your own independent ideas. Um, thanks so much, Tony. I think I would echo a lot of, of what the first two panelists have said, and I think we were discussing a little bit backstage how challenging this question really is because civic engagement means so many different things to so many people, and it is, it's a very personal experience in a lot of ways, and so it makes it really hard to talk about it and what it means and how you really promote it sometimes. But I think um, from my perspective and, and the perspective of my organization, the National Conference on Citizenship, I would say that I think of it more as the process of taking taking an active role in creating the type of community in which you want to live and work. And I think that can be done in a variety of ways. It's volunteering, it's community service, it's voting, it's contacting your congressman, it's serving jury duty, it's staying connected to information and current events, it's doing favors for neighbors. Like it's just a really diverse um, set of, of skills and activities and actions and behaviors that really lead someone to be, to be civically engaged. But I think it's just really more of, of a wanting to make a contribution to the greater good and, create, and playing an active role in that is what I really think that it, that it means to be civically engaged. And one of the ways that we do that at the National Conference on Citizenship is we measure, track, and promote civic participation um, in a lot of the areas that I just mentioned. But what we really want to do is understand more of the challenges in our communities and how people are, are engaging and connecting with each other and what sort of policy, programs, initiatives can really be developed to help people people be more active participants in their communities. One of the things that I think um, online engagement and social media really does to help inform our work is we are actually a 65-year-old institution. We were founded in 1946 and received our congressional charter in 1953. And what it means to be an active, informed, and engaged citizen in 2011 is not the same, necessarily the same thing that it meant in 1946. And so in a lot of ways, I think that we are charged to define modern citizenship and what ways are people currently engaged in their communities. And that's where I think it's really important to have conversations like this about online engagement and civic engagement. In a lot of ways, even a lot of the surveys and um, metrics that we use don't really capture a lot of those activities because they're so rapidly expanding and evolving. So in the same way that you know, the census used to just ask you, uh, you know, do you put a bumper sticker on your car or do you put a, uh, a lawn sign in your yard for, for a politician or, or a candidate, now I think it's important to say, do you put a cause on Facebook? Do you support a, a political candidate you know, through, through online engagement? So a lot of the ways that people are fundamentally interacting with each other are changing because of these tools. And I think it's important that the way we talk about that and that we measure that and that we promote that can, can keep up with it. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today. Once again, my name is Andrew Slack. And I think the, uh, all three of you just answered that question. I'd almost say I'll just skip, but, uh, but I have one thing to add um, that's a, a, a slightly different approach to that question. Uh, real fast, who here is 14? Raise your hands. 15? 16? 17? 18? 19? 44? 50? Okay, <laughs> all right. So, uh, and, and obviously I can't see you if you're watching this on a live webcast, but uh, hi. Um, <laughs> so I, one of our members in the Harry Potter Alliance and uh, somebody who lived real close to me in Boston, she and I became very close friends. Uh, her name's Esther. Uh, she died in the end of August, uh, at the age of 16. And uh, she did so much in terms of civic engagement. She had uh, cancer when, when we met. And uh, she died, and, and her death was, one, was something that changed me, and our friendship something that changed me, a tremendous deal. It got me thinking about a lot of things. I'm very close with her family still. And the way she lived is more important to me than the fact that she died. And I bring this up for a reason. Um, first of all, here's a shocking statistic. 100% of babies born today are going to die. That's, an, that's injustice. Um, it's just a joke. We're all going to die. Um, and there's a little story that I heard about this that's very inspirational, and it ties into this question. So don't, 
feel like I'm just rambling. Uh, uh, there's a, there was this little boy wave in the ocean, just flopping around, being a wave, having fun, thinking about girl waves. And uh, all of a sudden, he realized what's going to happen to him. He, re he saw that he's going to smash into the shore and just, boom, smash into the shore. And, and, uh, and he was miserable over this, just so scared and sad and felt like his life was pointless. And he just starts moping around and thinking he's so smart because he's moping around and how stupid all the other waves are that are happy because if only they knew that we're all going to die. And then he saw a little girl wave who was happy, bopping around on being a wave. And she looks at him and says, why are you so sad? And he says, well, you don't see the truth. You don't understand what I understand. You know, we're all moving quickly to the shore. And when we do, we're going to smash apart and we're going to be nothing. And we're going to die. And she, she smiled and looked at him sympathetically and said, no, you don't understand. You're not just a wave. You're a part of the ocean. Mm. And to me, that is the fundamental reality as to how we want to think about civic engagement versus not being civically engaged. Do we want to have this attitude that's all about me? I mean, if you want to have an attitude that's all about me, I'm cool with that. But uh, if, if you want to have an attitude where it's all about you, and you, 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 me, 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 it's, it's not that happy, actually. It's sort of counterintuitive, but it doesn't bring that much happiness. When we acknowledge it's a reality that we're all united in some way, some larger way, that we're all a part of the ocean, then we can think about that and think about something bigger than ourselves. And then we can give love. And in the Harry Potter lines, we say the weapon we have is love. And for those who have read Harry Potter, love plays a very crucial role in fighting Voldemort, uh, the most crucial role, as the most powerful form of magic. And unlike money, love is something that the more you give, the more you get. It just keeps spreading. Money, maybe money is the same thing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people in our communities that need love. There's a lot of people sitting next to you that need love. Probably if you look in the mirror, you need love. If we spread that, that matters a great deal. But then if we have a sophisticated understanding that the people in Washington and the people in the UN, in these the people in companies that we, we pay, they make decisions that end up affecting the people that we love and people that we never met who we would love and we can love right now. And that they'll affect their level of, of, of happiness and suffering and all of that stuff. We begin developing a more sophisticated approach to this. So thinking about the people sitting next to you, the people in your community who may feel lonely, who are elderly, who are sick, et cetera, um, and the people in our larger world and how decisions are made politically, systematically. This is all forms of civic engagement. It's a very diverse thing. But I think the fundamental truth is, no matter what you feel about politics or whatever it is, that we're part of an ocean here. And to acknowledge that we are holding each other here, and it, it makes our lives so much more meaningful and so much more exciting than this sort of self-centered approach uh, to life. So that's my sort of philosophical answer. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. And I wanna pick up on that idea of, of you're not just a wave, you're a part of the ocean, and, and tie that in with our next question, which is how does social media help foster civic engagement? And my, my initial thought is that in some ways, social media helps us see that how big the ocean is and how big you know, our, our expanse is and how big our reach can be and helps us realize we're not just a wave, we're not just a small lake, we're actually part of a much larger movement. Uh, and so my, my question to you is, how does social media help foster civic engagement? And then if you could share some examples from the work you do, in no particular order for this one, as you uh, feel you have a, a good response, you can, you can chime in. So social media, how does it help foster civic engagement? So I think one of the ways that it really helps foster civic engagement is because no longer do people have to wait for an organization to come to them and ask them to vote or ask them to serve or ask them to get their friends involved in something. They can stand up and say, you know, this is something that's important to me and I want to do that. So I think it's, it's helping um, as we're seeing a little bit of like a power shift in some ways in terms of, you know, a lot of organizations are becoming less centralized and going to more of like a network-based, community-based strategy and seeing how um, 
empowering their supporters or their volunteers to be advocates on their behalf actually decreases some of their workload and gets more people involved and bought into the process. So I think that that's really important. I also think that social media provides a really low cost, low barrier of entry, um, easy way for people to take action where they might not have, have been able to um, otherwise before, whether it's you know volunteering for a cause, sharing their opinions with others, getting, getting other people involved. Um, our civic health Health Index, we produce a report called the Civic Health Index, which measures the civic um, actions, attitudes, and behaviors of our country as well as our communities. And it actually found that in a lot of ways, um, the internet is benefiting civic health. People, especially millennials, people like the ones in this room, um, and those of us on this stage as well, like young people who use the internet for civic purposes are more likely to be involved offline in their communities as well. Um, there have been a number of other studies that have found this. There was one recently put up by the, um, the YPP uh, network of um, Circle and uh, the MacArthur Foundation that found the same thing, that people who, who pursue their interests on the internet are more likely to vote, they're more likely to be civically engaged, they're more likely to serve um, in their communities. Excellent, thank you. Hey, Andrew. Um, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of cool examples. First, first of all, um, the Harry Potter Alliance, we use parallels from Harry Potter to inspire Harry Potter fans to be heroes in our world. Um, but we work with other things besides Harry Potter as well. And um, one of those is a group called the Nerd Fighters. And uh, they're not people who fight nerds. They are nerds <laughs> who fight. Um, and the, the concept is that uh, unlike ordinary people who are made of muscle and bone and flesh and nerves, uh, nerds are made of the force of awesome. And it's only the force of awesome that can fight the force of world suck. And world suck is the amount of suck that exists in the world. So we want to take the force of awesome and fight the force of world suck. Um, and one of the leaders of, the, the, the two leaders of this community, their names are John and Hank Green, and they make these amazing YouTube videos every week. They're two brothers that, are, that just started as a little project where they were video blogging to each other. But they're really funny and they're really interesting. And if you can check them out at youtube.com slash vlog, V-L-O-G, brothers. Um, and just a quick example, they're, you know, they call their following the Nerd Fighters. Last May, uh, last year, Hank turned 30. And John would have videos saying that for Hank's birthday, we're going to do a big thing. Hank, don't watch anymore, or click here so Hank doesn't watch this. It's going to be a big surprise. They get hundreds of thousands of views every week. They have a very strong following. Every year, they take over YouTube with nerd fighters creating their own videos about what's awesome in the world. And YouTube is paying attention and now has, has, uh, has partnered with them. It's been really amazing. It's really increased awareness around all these different amazing organizations. But uh, to, to speak to Hank's birthday, on Hank's birthday last year, John said, Hank, you're 30, and I realize you don't really like many things, like in terms of things I could buy you. You don't like stuff, so I didn't know what to get you for your 30th birthday. But then I remembered, Hank likes oxygen. So Hank, for your 30th birthday, nerd fighters across the world have planted 20,000 trees in your name. And then he showed a 10-minute video of people in Iraq, of people all over the United States, um, all, I think almost every continent but Antarctica, this beautiful music of them all planting trees and had signs say, happy birthday, Hank. It was one of the coolest things I've ever seen was this like global effort to do that. And we worked with John and Hank in the, uh, the aftermath of uh, the, the earthquake in Haiti. And we, we worked with all these different people and we wanted to do something and we just reached out to everyone we possibly knew, including J.K. Rowling herself, who sent us seven Harry Potter books, all seven signed by her with a note saying, thank you for helping Haiti. We reached out to the actors in the movies. They all donated things and we raffled them off. So for $100, you can get a raffle ticket to get those seven books. Or for $70, you can get the guy who plays Draco Malfoy, his guitar in, um, signed by him. Or exclusive art from the Ghostbusters, et cetera. And we got on live webcasts, and we had all of these different famous authors and different um, famous YouTube celebrities get on these live webcasts, which you're on right now. And we were tweeting HHH, which was helping Haiti heal. And that became a trending topic on Twitter. And we were all doing this all online. And within two weeks, from people your age, we raised over $123,000 from small donations. Um, 
and that sent five cargo planes to Haiti full of medical supplies. Each of them was named after a different Harry Potter character, except for one, which was for the nerd fighters, uh, the DFTBA, which stands for Don't Forget to Be Awesome. And we, we all have the power to create these contagious things. I mean, who here is on Facebook? Who's here on, who, who here is on Twitter? Anybody on YouTube? Okay. So the ones who didn't raise your hands, I'd recommend doing it because you all of a sudden are kind of famous in this really weird way. In 2006, Time Magazine made the person of the year you, meaning all of us were the person of the year because we are the ones that are recreating our world. We have that chance. You're not in this, these isolated little worlds with your school and your community and all that stuff. You get on the internet, you put something up there, anyone can see it. That is a fundamental difference between now and the 90s when I was a teenager. Uh, that's just totally different, totally exciting. And it means that we can make things that are contagious. Sometimes they're not going to be contagious, sometimes they are. Uh, I used to be a comedian. I put out three videos that had been seen over 10 million times. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I just couldn't believe that that had happened. Um, and we're just living in a different age, and we're, we're going to be talking more about that. But there's so much good that we can do at that age, and you guys come up with ideas and work with other people to come up with ideas on how that could work. Thank you. Um, I would kind of echo a lot of what Andrew was saying, um, that I think that, you know, really talking about what, how social media and technology really kind of foster civic engagement is really focusing in on that social piece um, and really kind of redefining how we look at talking about community, that now at this point we're no longer just restrained to, you know, having, making connections with people who go to our school, who go to our church, who live up the block from us, or who might be in some sort of a club with you. You can find, you know, people, you know, he has an entire community that's connected around one particular kind of piece of content and kind of sort of you know theme of how they want to kind of interact with the world. But you know at this point you're not limited by who you can actually physically see. So if I can go online, whether I'm into spoken word, I'm into basketball, or if I'm just explicitly into politics, whatever it may be, you're making more real and authentic connections with people than you would have been able to do 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I think it's that connection from person to person. You know by it's a very basic concept, but you know we're social people, and I think what motivates us oftentimes is not just kind of our own interests, but is how our, our own interests can kind of relate to you know how it may help or connect to what somebody else or another group is actually doing. So I think now that we can actually you know develop community in a very different way, then that's what really you know provides a lot more connections that will really push us and motivate us to you know really be more kind of civically engaged and such. Cool. Um. I think that your generation has a huge responsibility. Uh, there's so many challenges that we face as a nation and as a world. I mean, everything from the economy. I mean, we all know people who are out of work, who can't find jobs. Um, there's the issue of climate change and global warming. There's wars going on around the world. There's all of these challenges that we face in the world. Some of it's not new. Our parents face challenges. Our grandparents faced huge challenges. Ronald Reagan dealt with the challenge of communism in the world. And I do think that this is an, a different time and that your generation, that you guys are going to be called on to deal with some pretty big challenges. But one of the things that you have that your parents didn't have, that your grandparents didn't have, is a way to gain political power and to have a voice that's never existed before in the whole history of the world. I mean, if my grandparents wanted to get a message to the President of the United States or to round up a thousand people for a cause, it would take years, or it might be impossible. But today, you have direct access to people in power through social media. You can get on the President's Facebook page. You can get on the White House Facebook page. Each of your local elected officials, if you have issues in your own community where you know, there's potholes in your road or there's crime in your neighborhood, you have immediate access to people in power who can do something about it through social media. 
You can create a Facebook group and get hundreds of your friends to join it for an issue, and people will pay attention. You have no lack of access or power. For the first time in history, in the entire history of the world, young people have a voice. They have a seat at the table. They have a way of gaining access to people in power and to uh, government agencies and to their local elected officials and to companies that make decisions that impact millions of lives. But with that access and with that power that's never existed before, there's also a great responsibility. So I think that social media um, that was invented by your generation is going to change the world if your generation leverages it in the right way. I'm just, that was an awesome Spider-Man reference, by the way. <laughs> and anyone seen Spider-Man, the first one? Toby Maguire, Uncle Ben, right before he got killed, was like, Pete, with great power comes great responsibility. Don't make Uncle Ben die in vain. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask a quick follow-up question to that question. Uh, Melissa, you were mentioning challenges, and this is open to anybody, but you, you talked about challenges and how young people have a voice, a seat at the table. Now, one of the things that is sometimes said about this generation is that they're, they're given the, the label of slacktivists. <laughs> right, and I know you guys are probably familiar with this term, and, and some of you might be. It's a combination of slacker and activist, and really, you're not really engaged if you if you click. There's kind of the you know, it's it, you're not doing the same thing. Like Malcolm Gladwell, for example, wrote a piece in the New Yorker saying that today's people who click on Facebook and join causes aren't nearly the same sort of activists that we had in the '60s, who were sitting in at lunch counters. Uh, and so I wanted to just kind of get your thoughts, your response to to that charge. Is that what you see, or do you see it a little bit differently? So I think, I think that, that you know, there are some good points there. I think what, to, to really kind of echo your points around balancing you know, the responsibility that comes along with kind of that access, I think we need to really kind of think around, it's, it's, you know, it, it is not necessarily the same thing if I just like a Facebook page around a cause, right? That we do need to make sure that there is this transition from this kind of this digital piece and this kind of very, um, very passive engagement with whatever an issue is, but you know, and how does that connect to actually what you may actually physically be doing in your community, where there's donations, where there's mobilizing some other folk. I think if you're going to really be deeply engaged around changing something, you have to be doing something. And, you know, liking a page and sharing a page to some extent that does maybe have limited, limited impact or requires limited commitment. But what they are are, are tools in a toolbox, right? So if we have responsibility to impact change and we have this incredibly different landscape now, then, you know, we don't want to discount what it really does mean for one person to share that one link with 10 people and then those 10 people to share it with another 10 of their friends and now all of a sudden within you know one hour you have something that's spread out to 10,000 different people right it might be you know a passive level of engagement but if that passive engagement you know of just sharing that link leads to even just 10 percent or five percent of these people really taking up that issue or having a you know better understanding of what this issue may be and then being able to get more deeply involved with it I think we need to recognize that and actually appreciate that so um, the other side of it as well is what I would, you know, push back on any adults that have, you know, that want to kind of go in that slacker and kind of put that passive label on any young folk. Adults, we all have the responsibility to work with you guys to make sure that, you know, one, we understand how you guys already leverage and use this space, but, you know, we help you guys think around, you know, how you might better use Facebook, Twitter, text messaging, these skills that you guys already have. But how does that now, how can that compare and be just as impactful as the sit-ins during the civil rights era, right? So there's nothing, you know, it's not, there's nothing really new under the sun in my mind. Um, I think we just have different tools to actually have, you know, to have certain types of impact. But, you know, because there are, there is another generation, there are adults that should have some perspective around, you know, how this has happened in the past. We should work with young people to make sure young people are educating the adults so we really understand the space a little bit better so folk like Gladwell understand what it does really mean to, you know, what the value is of just liking that page or sharing that page. Um, but we need to really work together to make sure we're not discounting everything 
everything that you guys are already doing. So I think we need to be kind of very intentional around understanding what each thing, each small thing, you know, to use Andrew's metaphor around the wave in the ocean, you know, we need to really understand like how, you know, one shift can really kind of have that larger impact over time. So, you know, whether it's in schools, it's parents being involved, or you guys just being a little bit more clear about it with yourselves, you know, how do we really leverage all of these tools to have any sort of impact and being clear on what the impact you want is too. Mm -hmm. So end of the day, just saying that I care about global warming and doing nothing, eh, it's not really that much. So, but if you can't, you know, if you do have a clear goal in mind, you understand how you use social media um, to actually have some sort of, you know, uh, uh, impactful piece that you can look at and say, I, I, I influenced something, I impacted something, I was a part of this community that cared about this one thing, um, then I think that's worth recognizing and that's from a, adults and educators and parents, that's really worth us also supporting. I'm really glad you, you mentioned that, Akili, and I actually had written down something about activism as well, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, and it kind of goes to somebody texted a minute ago up, up here, um, I wish my parents could hear this discussion. And I think that this really goes to, um, to Akili's point about because our generation these tools were invented by us, and we, we were the early adopters to these, there is sort of this inherent misunderstanding about you're just playing around on Facebook all day, and what, what did you tweet about? Don't, I don't care what you had for breakfast. And like, it's not, it's not necessarily about that. But even in the case that, that it is, and you know that people are liking things on Facebook or joining causes that maybe they're not donating to right away, or maybe they're not volunteering for right away, it's an on-ramp to civic engagement. Like it's a really low barrier of entry way to get somebody involved. So saying join my cause on Facebook now, maybe next time I can ask you for a $5 donation. And maybe the time after that I'll ask you to come do this run walk with me. And maybe the time after that you'll help me champion a team. Like it's it's all about nobody comes in and so through social media or not, like nobody comes into a cause saying I am ready to cure cancer. <laughs> you know, like they come in and say I'm going to take baby steps to find ways that I can use my network and my skills to make a difference. And I think social media really provides the opportunity for that. But to, to Achilles' point, it's not the end. It's a means to an end. But I do think that there are some inherent values in actions that occur online that are really taken for granted in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to sharing opinions and fostering conversations about issues that are important to us with people who we might not get to talk to um, on a daily basis or we might not share share those personal things within the daily course of our daily lives. I I need like five hours to talk about this question, but um, so <laughs> buckle your safety belt. Now, uh, has anyone seen Malcolm Gladwell? A picture of him? <laughs> he has a giant afro. It's really cool. <laughs> but I'm going to throw out there that he has a really really big head, um, like arrogant, because it was a that article was. I think ridiculous. Um, I, I mean, it's, it, I think it raised some really important questions because too many people take for granted the power of social media and think it's really important. So I think he did raise some really, really important questions. But first of all, historically, his summation of the civil rights movement was oversimplified. And beyond that, he's just, I mean, like, I, he is like one of the hippest and coolest people out there. And I don't know when he decided to become like an old man complaining about the kids today. Like, but that's kind of what happened in that article. And now he's not going back. He's like, people are like, hey, Malcolm Gladwell, what about Egypt? Hey, Malcolm Gladwell, what about Tunisia? People are using Facebook and Twitter and ending dictatorships through these things. What do you think now? And he's like, I still think the same thing I thought before. I'm like, really, Malcolm? Because you're like, I like your afro, but um, <laughs> I, I, you know, there's, there definitely are valuable questions that he posed in that article, but I think beyond that, the reason why it's such a silly question, it's like saying, like, te telephones have had a, like, it, it, telephones are part of our lives, right? Almost everyone here uses a phone in some way, a cell phone or a telephone. Probably everyone here does. It just permanently changes everything. It's just part of your life. So evaluating whether that's important or not is just kind of silly. Politicians always call people and say, hey, vote for me. That's just one method of communication. So then critiquing this idea of using Facebook and Twitter is not valuable, it, it just strikes me as kind of like, just what are we even talking about? It exists. So like, I mean, I understand we should be evaluating its importance, but um, by the way, 
I, I take some special uh, offense to the term slacktivism, because, okay, uh, all right. Um, it's my last name, if you didn't catch that. Um, so I, I, I do think that you all are in positions of the beginnings of great power. If anyone here wants to be an actor or a writer or a comedian, I mean, do it now. Don't say that you're going to like, you know, I mean, do it right now and do it with a cause. And there's ways to do it. Talk to me later. Email me at andrew at the hpalliance.org. I'll give you some tips on how to make a video vi like viral. Does anyone know what viral means? Getting it moving, getting it contagious? Just put kittens in the video. Everyone will watch it. You get like a million views. Don't just put yourself in like a dimly lit room saying, I really think that this and this. No, just show kittens and then put a voiceover of the kittens being like, this is what we think. And everyone's going to think that's hilarious because kittens are hilarious. Um, or make a parody of a movie that's coming up. I mean, you can do these things and create change that we never could have before. You know, we're at the Ronald Reagan uh, Library, and this is someone who's known as the great communicator, who changed permanently the way we view, view uh, communications and politics. Where right now, President Obama, it, he wouldn't be president if, were it not for social media. Somebody else would have been president. Um, but it was social media that got him elected president. And we're looking at huge things like Reagan and Obama, these towering figures in history. And, but we are towering figures in history now. All of us, you. Uh, Thomas Friedman, who I don't always, um, who sometimes I like much less than Malcolm Gladwell, had a great quote uh, where he said um, that the only competition that exists now is the one between us and our own imaginations. Mm -hmm. So imagine kittens. Like, what I mean, what I mean is, you can make a video that gets a million views and have, like, I know the guy who made the evolution of dance. Has anyone seen that, that video? I knew him before he was famous. It's one of the most like, famous YouTube videos out there. It's like one of the most poorly filmed things I've ever seen. And does anybody know the most viewed video on YouTube ever? It's a baby biting another baby's finger. Like, <laughs> like things can, you know, that, this is ridiculous. And you can put in a message to get people involved in those videos. Have some freaking fun. You know, I, I don't like Heath Ledger's The Joker, but he made a good point when he said, why so serious? You know, why do we have to make everything so serious? Like, we can have fun and have kittens and have babies biting each other's fingers and still put in a message on how you can get involved in issues that matter. And we're seeing that change, and we're seeing it in Egypt and Tunisia and across the Middle East right now, and we're seeing it right now in our own communities. And you guys have... If you don't think you have power, if you think your parents don't understand you, I guarantee you, you probably do think your parents don't understand you. Like, yeah, they probably don't, but that's okay. You can get the world to understand you on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. You know, these are powerful things, so, you know, use it. I'm not following kittens. <laughs> <laughs> didn't believe that one yeah. Excellent. All right, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead, actually. We have about five minutes left before we get to the uh, audience submitted questions. So I want to, let's say, have about a minute apiece mm -hmm. for, for this question, which is uh, innovative ways in which organizations, corporations, nonprofits are encouraging civic engagement, especially with uh, the, the age we have today. So I thought it might give you an opportunity to talk about specifically so, uh, the ways that your work uh, reaches out to this audience. Um, so, about five weeks ago, I uh, launched a, a website called SplashLife.com, and the, the website itself, as you come to Splash Life, there's all of these opportunities to take action and make a difference and learn about issues that affect young people. And as you learn about those issues, like you read the articles or you comment on them, or you share them on Facebook, which you can do right from the site, or you tweet a link to the article, which you can do straight from the site, you earn points. And so we've built this points program around causes where the more points you earn, you start to get deals and discounts and awards on everything that you buy, from computers to jeans to airline tickets to um, you know, anything you can imagine. Um, so one of the things that we think is important at Splash Life is if you're gonna take the time 
to invest in the world around you or you're going to invest in your own lives because there's a lot of like information about financial education, how to get a bank account, how to get a job, all those kinds of things. Um, you earn points. So the more you invest in yourself and your own life in the world, the more Splash Life invests in you. So we're trying to add a sort of gaming and fun element to it. We have members that have earned thousands of points already, um, and you earn points the more you do. So that's what Splash Life is doing. Yeah. I think all my fellow panelists are people who I would give examples of organizations who are doing incredibly innovative and amazing things. Um, but as I mentioned before, like a lot of what um, a lot of what the power of I think that these these tools do is it doesn't require nonprofits or corporations or governments to to empower people. So there are lots of tools to give um, to let people, you know, do, do things themselves. And so a couple examples of those, and I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this, but I just saw somebody tweeted me because um, they saw that it was my birthday today. Happy and birthday. so somebody did some good, some good research. And so thanks for my happy birthday tweets. But one of the ways that I um, have chosen to spend my birthday, not just here with you guys, which thanks so much for having me, um, but is also I decided to donate my birthday to charity. And so I started a cause on Facebook. Facebook, which allows me to tell people that, hey, instead of buying me a gift for my birthday this year, why don't you give a, a donation to this cause? Um, and so if you want to check it out, um, the, uh, the URL for it is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash K-C, capital letters, hyphen B-Day. And you can check out the cause that I selected. It's called Team Rubicon, and it mobilizes um, young veterans who have medical training to be first responders for disasters. And one of the reasons I chose them particularly, because I knew I was going to get to talk about this today, was because they do a lot of communication and mobilization, not just within their network, with, but with also, with, um, also with their supporters um, about the work that they're doing via, via social media. And so I just think that, it, that it's a really great cause. But that's, that's an example of, of the time that you didn't need an organization to, um, to ask you to, to be involved, you, you can. Um, another, a couple other ways is there are applications called like sparked.com and the extraordinaries that are micro volunteering applications. So if you have 10 minutes and a cell phone, you can volunteer. So I can sit at the airport, um, which I'll be doing later today. Um, I can sit at the airport and I can volunteer through my mobile phone. So there are just all sorts of, of awesome ways that people are getting involved. One example that's happening right here in California is the San Ramon Valley Fire Department has an, an application for your iPhone that if you're CPR certified, you can download this app and it uses geolocation services that if somebody in your immediate vicinity goes into cardiac arrest, it will send you a text message and tell you that there's a person three doors down from you that needs CPR services and you can go over and you can probably save that person's life in a lot of ways. And that's just, that is one of the most innovative, amazing, and inspiring inspiring examples I can think of of a way that even a government institution has been able to use um, use these these uh, these tools and these technologies. One other example that I just think is really amazing is it's not it's not always about the tools. And so sometimes I think we think a lot about um, my organization hosted a panel recently. We, recently. Um, we host a fellow from Egypt who participated um, in the Egyptian revolution via, largely via social media. And one of the comments that came out of that discussion was somebody said, um, the revolution would have happened on papyrus if it had to. So it was less about the tools, it was more about the will of the people. And I thought that that was really interesting and, and poignant and goes back to some things that my fellow panelists were saying earlier about making sure that we recognize them as tools and not as a be all end all. Twitter didn't overthrow <laughs> Mubarak, um, the people of Egypt overthrew Mubarak and they used Twitter as a way to help, to help do that. Um, another, just one more example. I, as Andrew said, I could take five hours to talk yeah. about examples of amazing things that I think people are doing because it's just so, so inspiring. Um, but another example is, do you guys remember when the iPad came out? And on Twitter, there were all these conversations about what a horrible name <laughs> iPad was. And everybody was making all these jokes about feminine hygiene products. And it was really sort of uncomfortable. And there was this I tampon hashtag. And everybody was sort of like, oh my gosh, this is mortifying. Like, this is totally inappropriate. Why would they pick this name, blah, 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 blah. 
Um, a, a friend of mine, um, she actually used the opportunity to take that, that meme where people were um, telling these, in some ways, kind of crass jokes that were making people feel uncomfortable. And she said, you know, th these are all funny jokes, um, but did you know that X number, and I forget the number, I'm sorry, but X number of women in Africa do not have access to feminine hygiene products. And it inhibits them a lot of times from being able to go to school and get educated because they have to, they have to stay home. And so while you're, while you're joking about iPad and iTampon, you might consider giving to this organization um, who, who is providing these services to women in rural communities in Africa. And that was something that, again, it, it was not about Twitter. It was not about the fact that, that Twitter did it. It was right. that she saw something that was happening on Twitter and turned that into an authentic opportunity for people to give back. And I just think that that's so powerful. That is so cool. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, what we're doing in the Harry Potter Alliance, um, we, like I said, using parallels from Harry Potter. Who's read Harry Potter? Who's seen the movies? Who's looking forward to July 15th? <laughs> cool, yeah. Um, and we're, we're, we're fighting Voldemort in the real world. We're, we're doing a whole campaign right now against horcruxes in our world. Um, each month a different horcrux, the Dementor horcrux, which causes us anxiety and depression. Um, uh, everything from that to child slavery. And it turns out that like a lot of our chocolate is made by child slaves in the Ivory Coast. And fair trade chocolate can make that not happen, can make that disapparate. So we're asking Warner Brothers to make all Harry Potter chocolate fair trade. We have over 15,000 signatures right now including from Ivana Lynch, who's become a good friend. She plays Luna Lovegood in the movies. And I'm about to meet with uh, Warner Brothers this week, I believe, um, to talk to them about how we can work together to make that happen. Um, and uh, we're in the middle of doing all these wonderful things that we've done. We're building a, a library in Brooklyn, a charter school right now. We've donated a total of over 75,000 books across the world uh, to a youth village in Rwanda. This is all through social media and through chapters, you know, um, uh, working in their school, starting Harry Potter lines chapters. But beyond that, there was this quote from J.K. Rowling that was marvelous. She said, we do not need magic to change the world. We have all the power we need inside of us already. We have the power to imagine better. We're creating a new project, a new organization called Imagine Better. If you're a fan of any book, TV show, or movie, then you could be part of Imagine Better and talk about how we can take that book, TV show, or movie and make it real. You know, when you saw Avatar, let's fight the sky people in the coal industry and protect um, the, uh, what was, what's it called, Pan Pandora? Pandora, yeah. Pandora in our world. Um, and uh, against the climate crisis. So that kind of stuff. And bringing together the world's most prominent YouTube celebrities and Twitterers and all this stuff all together so that we're all working together to imagine better, which is what we're all doing and what you're all doing every time you log on to Facebook but we can do it better because, you know, in Harry Potter, as we see, magic is an amoral force. It could be used for good or bad. And so is the same as social media. My friend who's Teach for America, she said, my students use Facebook to organize where they're gonna fight in the hallways. Like, that's not good. <laughs> um, so let's try to use this magic for defense against the dark arts, you know? So, uh, and that's what we're working to do. And anyone can get involved with us at the, uh, the, the hpa.org. So I'll try to be uh, brief, but you know, Andrew asked an interesting question earlier today in terms of how many of you guys are already on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera. So I would just actually maybe ask a second part to that question. How many of you guys, by a show of hands, are able to access Facebook while you're in school at all, or any social network? It's actually a pretty, from the school computers? That's actually a pretty surprising number for one, actually. So California, you guys might be a little bit ahead. How about YouTube? Okay, so still a little bit of a mix, which is good. So going back kind of to this, this, this toolbox concept that all of these social media outlets, all these digital media tools are really just kind of tools that you can put into a toolbox to help accomplish whatever goal you all identify. I think one thing that I would throw out there that, you know, a challenge towards, you know, really other kind of educators, policymakers, et cetera, that are really, you know, um, 
whether they're you know, looking at, at schools, libraries, museums, et cetera, anything that, that are spaces where kids and teens are gonna be interacting, how are we helping you guys get you know, access but also get the skills so you can help navigate all of these spaces in a much more impactful manner? So from our end, um, with Digital Youth Network, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last three or four years is one, we developed a uh, social learning network um, where all of the schools that we work with and the libraries that we work with, all of the participants, be they middle school kids, high school kids, can continue to connect to all all of their peers, the mentors, and all the work that they're doing through a social network online. So we're actually trying to bring all the interactions that you guys are already used to doing day to day, whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, anywhere else, and say we appreciate that, we understand the value in it, and we know that those connections that you guys make through those sites, the, the, the reflections that you guys have on topics on, or the ability to share out your own thoughts and your own pieces of work, that's a very important thing. So how can we recognize that and actually design experiences around that? So for one, from the uh, DYN inside, we're definitely trying to make sure that we can look at saying how can, you know, folk that are working with teens really make sure that we can kind of bring more of that into whether it's the classroom space or kind of a, a after school space, et cetera. Um, another thing that we've been doing um, for the last two years is we have a partnership with uh, Chicago Public Library where we're trying to essentially kind of remix the library experience. So, you know, if you guys traditionally go into any library, it's, you know, be as quiet as possible go in and get a book if you're even interested in going and get a book still, um, but it's not really much of a dynamic experience. It's been the same thing for you know however long. Um, what we've done in downtown Chicago is open up a 5,000 square foot space um, for teens to engage in digital media um, inside of the library. So it's strictly for teens. Any kid in the city that has a library card can come in and for free get access to equipment. We had laptops, cameras, a music studio, video games, et cetera, but also can get, a con get in access to uh, mentors, so like professional artists who are actually, you know, if you're interested in making YouTube videos, can you get connected with a video, professional video, video producer or video editor? If you're interested in doing music, you know, can you get access to professional music producers or rappers and singers who can actually help you hone that craft some and give you guys that access where you can then, you know, not just, you know, spend time on Facebook and YouTube, but if you identify a cause or you just want to express yourself in a certain way, um, you have that skills and those, those tools, that toolbox is being developed over time, so you guys are actually empowered to be even more um even more impactful in terms of these environments. So I would say how to, you know, a challenge to all of us working with folk like you guys is to listen more so to you all in terms of how you want to communicate, what those skills that you value are, and we need to figure out how we can help kind of bring that in a little bit more so. Um, and that, you know, I think a lot of examples that you guys have already talked about as well in terms of even like, you know, apps. So some things that don't seem like they would be around kind of activism and such, you know, can we also not just, you know, point them to, to new apps? Can we help, you know, you guys be the new creators of those apps, right? It's, if we're only limited by our creativity, you guys can have the greatest idea. You know, that's a wonderful idea around the CPR. I was having a conversation with a, a group out of uh, the Bay Area, spoke from the youth radio, and they have their kids developing an app where they can, um, they can, uh, immediately kind of tap into their own network if they're having issues with, with the police in their community. And they can report that and it automatically goes out to their own network. But that's something that the kids can think up, but then can we work with the teens to really be able to have their own skills to develop those things so they actually can get out there. So we have the access now, we have kind of that, that transparency to make these new connections, but can we take it a step further to really talk about what are those skills um, that you guys can really develop over time um, that'll really make you, allow you guys to really make the most out of these spaces as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, now, one of the cool things about this, this panel that's been going on is, even though we've been the ones up here talking for the most part, uh, we've seen you guys have been in on the conversation through social media, through texting and uh, posting things on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but now I want to use the, the rest of our panel. We have about 15 or 20 minutes or so to actually get questions that have been coming in online, uh, if, if anybody wants to stand up and ask a question. So we'll, we'll go kind of back and forth. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to turn to uh, Janet, who's in the back there, who's been monitoring the online conversation and questions. And if anybody has a question they'd like to just stand up and ask in old media style, I guess, uh, you can uh, line up over here. We have a microphone, so if anybody wants to get up and ask a question, you can line up uh, by the delightful Miss Krista Kohlhausen there. And uh, so if anybody has a question, we'll do that. But what I'm going to do first is go ahead and ask uh, Janet to uh, submit a, one of the students submitted questions from online. Great. Our first question is, how can we get our technophobic parents involved in social media and all its benefits? All right, so technophobic parents. We'll just throw this open to the panel. Not everyone has to respond. If you 
want to hop in and respond on technophobic parents? I think that uh, one thing that, 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 that helps out a lot is that, you know, that parents, again, they think that you might just be on Facebook wasting your time, playing video games, wasting your time, et cetera. You, you guys also need to, you know, help your parents understand what the value of that is. If you are mobilizing folk off of Facebook, if you're organizing a, a group to do something in Facebook, if you have this new skill set where maybe you're not just a game player, but you're also maybe, you know, learning a program and you're designing your own games, how do you actually make sure you put that out in front of your parents? Parents love to see their kids creating new things and creating new experiences, but they're making so many assumptions around, you know, what it is that's happening when you're just staring at this phone all day or you're sitting in front of that laptop all day, mm -hmm. you know. You guys are spending all your time doing it, so make sure, so hopefully that you're clear on what the value is out of it. So how do you actually kind of bridge that gap and create these conversations with parents to make sure that, you know, we don't allow them to just kind of have these assumptions that we're just wasting our time away, you know, on the computer or on the cell phones, et cetera. I think one of the things, too, that's important is the same way that it's important, how it's important to get your friends involved, and that's to make it personal, to really show them the value of, the, of this and why it's important. And one example I'll give to that is my parents swore to me that they would never join Facebook. They were like, I'm afraid of it. It's too much personal information. Nobody needs to know what I'm eating for breakfast. I don't want to put all that out there. Like, no, no, I will never do it. My brother joined the Army. My brother's captain sent my parents a letter and said, we started a Facebook page for the, the troop, um, if that's the right word, um, for, for the, the troop that my brother was in. And you better believe my parents both had Facebook accounts in about 36 seconds. <laughs> um, they had Facebook accounts because it was the first time that they ever really felt like the, it provided them a very specific reason and very specific value add. So I think in the same way that, you know, we, we talk to our friends about it, like we have to talk to our parents about it in the same way and like, hey, mom, dad, like maybe, maybe you could sit down with me and like we could understand together like how Facebook works and I can show you about, about a Facebook cause and I can tell you, you know, how to, how to set up this profile and, and it's sort of, that might be their on-ramp um, to, to larger participation and also maybe getting off your case a little bit about spending too much time in front of the computer? I think I usually get the opposite question when I'm talking to young people, which is how do I keep my parents <laughs> off my Facebook page? Uh, because it's <laughs> private and I don't want them to know everything that's going on in my lives. Uh, but I think that Kristen's right, you know, making it personal is probably one of the most important things. I mean. Our parents did not grow up with these tools, mm -hmm. so e even even more important than getting them involved is helping to educate them so they at least support you in your efforts to use social media to become civically engaged. Um, and there's you know there's a lot lot you can do in terms of just showing them all of the different applications and things, but it's a it's a whole new world, and. Um, my mom is is also now on Facebook, and it takes time, but but uh, once they're on, they're they're just as addicted as we are. I can't get my mom to stop talking on Facebook right. now. <laughs> it's it's once people do it, I think that makes all the difference. My mom, in I don't know, in 2003, she was like, Andrew, I really want to learn the computer, and I just said to her. <laughs> You know, Mom, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be mean. I don't want to be mean, but there are certain people that are just meant for the computer, and there are certain people that aren't. You're just one of those people who aren't. <laughs> and, uh, and now, I don't know, on her own initiative, she, she, she's writing on my Facebook wall all the time about how much she loves me. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> um, and wow. and, uh, and she, she's, she got into things that she's interested in. She's very spiritual, my mom. She teaches classes now on spirituality, like on live webcasts. I'm like, oh my, you know more than I do now. She's like using everything, and it's just, I, I don't, once she started using it and having fun with it, um, and being a kid with it, is what, you know. But I also would encourage you to show your parents some of these examples we talked about today, or look up your own. All right, excellent. Uh, do we have a question? It looks like most of our questions are coming in online. Uh, 
Uh, just beforehand, we need to correct one small but important piece of information. The birthday girl's uh, name is misspelled, so just in case you're trying to find her, we oh. want to get it right on stage. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Happy birthday. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> I didn't even notice. Excellent. Yes. So it seems, it seems like most of our questions are coming in online. I saw it looked like a waterfall right, right. of questions that was coming down uh, as, as they were responding. So it looks like we have some slack to questioning going on. Uh, but let me go back to... Janet for another question. Well, I like the question that is um, at the top of the panel right now is how do I convince my principal to let us use YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and etc. <laughs> Challenging. Um, one, one way that I have seen this done that I thought was really interesting was I think it was a school in Texas and it was a high school that a, that a teacher started doing it and she was letting people tweet um, during her class and one of the things that she found that it helped to do was students who didn't always speak up were felt like they could ask questions or they could send in comments and they had a, a hashtag for their class. And so that way the thing that was also helpful in that was it let... Um, it lets students go back and check the hashtag to see notes and things that they might have that they might have <clears throat> missed when they were studying. And also, then when the teacher had to travel for like teacher training days or when she was on vacation or anything, she could also tweet into the class and say, "I'm watching you <laughs> on <laughs> Twitter. Like I can see if you're <laughs> posting things or not." Um, and so I think that there are a lot of challenges. And you know, and one of the things that she was very transparent about was it's hard for me to know if my students are actually paying attention or if they're you know doing other things because it's so easy to get distracted on it. Um, I think it's just, you know, maybe maybe something like that where you could sort of experiment with it a little bit and see if you can create some case studies and then make make a presentation to your principal. I think generally um, th it's the same with parents. Like they just don't necessarily understand it sometimes, but if you can sort of put together like a, a plan or a strategy or a proposal where you can say, this is how we feel like this would benefit our learning environment. This is how we feel like we would be able to better develop 21st century skills. Like this is why we think it's important. And and this is maybe like the code of conduct or like rules of you know participation that we will all agree to abide by. Then you know, I I would hope that a principal would be yeah. receptive to hearing a, a well thought through idea like that instead of just saying, "Hey, yo, can I check my Facebook during class?" <laughs> well, and I think that one of the big concerns um, that I've heard from educators is that in using social media and Facebook and things in class that you have issues of online bullying and there's mm -hmm. safety issues and things that would have to be grappled with. So I think that code of conduct is important. Um, showing your principals and your teachers that you're using social media responsibly, mm -hmm. that you're using it to um, further your education, to organize your student groups on campus to promote your sports teams um, and not for sort of negative behaviors, um, I think is an, an important step in, in having social media tools brought into the classroom and for you to be able to, to text in class and, you know, all those different things that students really want to do but that are kind of um, uh, banned in schools. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the responsible use, I think, that, mm -hmm. that administrators are worried about. I'm sure they see the value of it, but um, they have school safety concerns and things that, that trump everything else. I think, go ahead. Uh, well, the one thing I was going to say is that one, you know, well, a couple of things. that The good piece about that question is that, one, your principal is not the first person to have the challenge to be convinced to bring technology or social media into the classroom. Um, two, recognize that the principal has to answer to a lot of other folk, and sometimes it's actually not even their decision. If they're in, like, in a school district, the district level might dictate well, like, what what your computer network can get access to, so whether they're banning Facebook, banning YouTube, et cetera. But with that said, educators also, you know, they, they, they definitely should hear it from you guys, and I, I think um, their answers make a lot of sense that you guys should think around what some of the projects may look like, how are you guys using it productively, and make sure that's really transparent. Start that conversation with them. Um, but also, 
educators, you know, are impacted a lot by other educators, right, who've also gone through this already. And, you know, there's been a lot of work, you know, over the last, you know, four or five years or so really on thinking around what are these kind of, you know, trying not to get too academic, but what are these models for how you can really bring technology and social media into the classroom space. Um, so I think when we talk about these case studies that, you know, are really probably the easiest way to convince people a lot of times, can you show them a web page, a video or something of how somebody else has already done it? Um, being able to find that and put it in front of a principal is kind of an easy, quick way to make that argument as opposed to trying to have it figured out um, all on, on you guys' own. Um, there is a, a, a PBS just did a, a great documentary, and I'll, I'll try to post it to my Twitter. I'll post a link later, but they really talked about a lot of these these issues that just came out a couple of months ago, and it's it is focusing on how different folk are using digital media in different ways and how it can impact organizations, um, be they libraries, museums, but also schools. Um, so I think kind of finding a lot of these conversations that already exist. You have you know the teachers in the in the room probably are already familiar with this. There are a lot of teachers that have developed these online communities where they are interacting with these each other, right? These huge teacher communities that are just saying around how they can become better teachers. So they recognize, you know, at that level, the value of it. Um, so I think it's kind of helping, you know, maybe even partnering with them to bubble up that conversation to the principals, but also maybe to the folk at like the district level um, in your respective area as well. So I'll try to, you know, uh, add it on to the hashtag at some point, maybe throw out some links, but there are a lot of videos that are already out there um, that you can really try to, you know, just shoot over to them in an email that can really at least start the conversation where they're not coming into the conversation with assumptions that everything, you know, about Facebook is bad, about Twitter is bad. And, and I definitely think we need to make sure that we're tackling the issue of how folk are using social media if we bring it into the classroom. I think those bullying issues and everything are definitely real, but I'll be completely honest, I think they are, 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 that we're getting too afraid of engaging in the conversation because of those issues. So we see the cyberbullying being thrown out there and that just stops everybody dead in their tracks. Mm -hmm. But bullying is not a new issue, right? You leave the classroom and in the hallway and in in, you know, outside of the school, you know, the, there are bullying issues that are already there. So we have you know, approaches to how we actually tackle that. The question is now that we understand social media, say how do we take what we know about bullying or whatever that issue may be and make sure we kind of you know, bring that in so we have some sort of order around how we would actually engage in some of these tools. Um, it, it's also really good as, as organizers to think about, don't think of the principal or the superintendent or any of these things as your enemy. Mm -hmm. Think of them as your friend and think about that they might have a different way of looking at it. They have different interests, but you can, you can work together to find similar common ground. I mean, if you put up a Facebook group saying, my school should win the blue ribbon and get a lot of people to like it, uh, they're gonna kinda like that. Um, or if you think about you know, asking your principal, like we wanna get involved in the Project for Awesome this year, and look at all the amazing ways we could do that, and it could get good media for the school and, and show young people in our school doing good things. Um, the YouTube Project for Awesome. That's another thing. Go to your school board meetings mm -hmm. and bring it up mm -hmm. in positive ways. Great. Be mature young adults and dress appropriately and speak well. And, uh, and that, that really goes far. Excellent. All right. Thank you. And I think we have maybe one more time for one more question. Uh, we have, looks like we have an audience member who has a question here. So we will uh, go ahead. So go ahead. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'm from Wayne High School. And happy birthday, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> how can social media be used in a negative way? And how will young people know the difference? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really important question. And I think some of the, the things that were just mentioned about cyberbullying um, are, are definitely negatives. And so I think, think you, you have to tweet responsibly, um, <laughs> I guess. But one, some of the, the drawbacks, I mean, it's, it's certainly not all great and, and positive and, and you know, helpful, because um, there, there are some real challenges associated with it. Particularly, one of the things um, that I think is really challenging is you can put anything, as, as a citizen journalist, you can put anything you want on the internet, and it doesn't have to be fact-checked. It doesn't actually have to be correct. It doesn't have to be respectful or any, any of that. So a lot of times we perpetuate a lot of misinformation and it makes it really hard to distinguish opinion from fact or to even know if those facts are correct. And so I think that's really challenging. And so I think it's important for, um, for even schools, if we're, we're talking about, you know, how, how can schools encourage this is, is helping people understand how to research um, issues, how to determine what's opinion and what's fact, how to talk respectfully about current events, um, how to, you know, 
how to really um, make sure that everything that they're putting out there is, is actually correct and accurate, especially when it comes to things like political statements. I think we're seeing so much partisanship right now and, and really hateful messages being perpetuated very quickly um, online by political candidates and by, um, you know, by citizens as well. And so I think it's important to use things like politifact.com where you can fact check a lot of those, those statements and see what, what's actually true and not. And I think it's just important to, to have sort of your own like personal code of conduct and what you think is appropriate to be putting out there. I, I would say, um, you know, check, spell, like check twice, send once. <laughs> um, and make sure you really you really feel comfortable about that. But I think that it's, it's definitely a big element of personal responsibility that's associated with it. And, and I think that one of the, the biggest sort of challenges that young people face in terms of the social media world and um, you know taking stance for things and making public comments is that when you do, it's searchable by the world. So a lot of um, conversation in the media and in the press and in college campuses and in job recruiters' offices is that the stuff that you put online, don't think that just your friends are seeing it. Um, people are seeing it who you may interview for a job with one day or who may be evaluating your college application and determining uh, whether or not to admit you as a student. So just realize that you know, one of the biggest negatives or drawbacks that I've seen is that people posting things in a bad mood, you know, and it's so instantaneous, you can write anything in a moment. Um, and then it's hard to ever get, it's hard to get rid of that. And, and it can have an impact on your life. So always realize when you're involved in social media, when you're tweeting, when you're joining groups, that it's public. Um, that other people are going to hold you accountable for what you're doing. But um, other than that, I think that the positives yeah. uh, far outweigh the negatives and that you have the potential, like no other generation, like no other people in history, to take these tools and to change the world with them. I think I would have one quick example, just just to even just make that that real. You know, when we had the uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed and everything was spread out over over Twitter, you saw and this was a thing that kind of you know got got recognized after a while in a lot of articles. A lot of people were were on Facebook and on Twitter were kind of just retweeting this quote that they were attributing to to Martin Luther King, um, and it ended up being you know in in the spirit of the quote, you know, people knew what they were trying to retweet and what they were trying to say and what they were trying to convey. But, and they were trying to influence other people, right, to get their ideas out there about this point. But then, you know, you know, five, six hours passes and somebody actually sits down and apparently actually does, you know, does a good Google search and realize that maybe about two thirds of the quote is something that, that MLK actually said. And they just, somebody else just kind of tacked an extra sentence onto the top of that intentionally, unintentionally, who knows. But because everybody was just kind of quickly sharing and retweeting without thinking about where it came from, they had now this new quote that MLK supposedly didn't say at all. Um, but you have to think, I think you do have to think around like the, qual the quality of your messaging that you put out there. And we, we share things so quickly and it's such a fast paced piece that, you know, to Kristen's point, you really have to figure out how to do your research and balance, balance that out with, with, with how do you kind of, you know, have the most impactful messaging as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Excellent. And we're actually, I, I see there's a couple more questions, but we're just about out of time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask that after we end, if you guys want to ask the panelists in person afterwards, we'll do that. Because uh, we do want to make sure we get your, your questions answered, but we're just about out of time. So I'm going to wrap up, but come back afterwards and we'll, we'll get to them. Five, five more hours. Five more <laughs> hours, yeah. Uh, so I, I just want to wrap up, share a few highlights and things that I heard from our panelists uh, and say a few thank yous. Um, some of the things that I really stuck with me today from uh, Akili, the idea of, of leveraging your skills uh, when you get into the social media environment, pick things that you're good at, use those to become active and engaged in your community. Uh, from Melissa, making up your own mind on what you believe in, kind of stepping out and uh, using this time of your life to figure out who you are and what you stand for. Uh, from Andrew, kittens, and uh, you're not just a wave, you're a part of the ocean. And. Uh, from, uh, from Kristen, that, that social media is, is an on-ramp to civic engagement. It's not all of civic engagement. And those were some of the things that stood out. There was lots of other things that stood out. Those were just a couple of things that 
stood out for me. So what I'd like to do is, uh, first I'd like to uh, thank our remarkable panelists for spending a few hours of their valuable time to be here with us today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I'd, also, I'd also like to thank uh, Melissa Giller, who made the opening remarks today. Thank you again for uh, spending some time and contributing to our discussion today. I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues at the Walter and Lenore Annenberg Presidential Learning Center, Krista and Janet, for all the uh, behind the scenes stuff that they've been doing today to make it go well. Uh, our tech team that helped set up, this is kind of a new setup for what we're doing. Uh, so thank you to our, to our tech team and our graphics team for making today go smoothly. Uh, and finally, uh, a big huge thank you to, to all of you, to the students, to the teachers who are both here in person and who are watching with us online uh, for deciding that this is a, a discussion important enough for you to take part of, uh, to take part in and to contribute. Uh, I've really enjoyed seeing some of the things that are going on in the back channels. Uh, so thank you very much and have a terrific rest of your day. Thank you.